This is chapter six from The Bolsheviks Rise to Power by Alexander Rabinowich. Chapter six is called The Rise of Kornilov. For Russian liberals and conservatives who had prematurely celebrated the demise of Bolshevism and the turn toward firm government and order in the wake of the July uprising, developments in the second half of July and the first weeks of August were shattering. During this troubled time, all Petrograd newspapers were filled with indications of the deepening political and social crisis engulfing Russia. Each day brought fresh reports of expanding anarchy and violence among land-hungry peasants in the countryside, disorders in the cities, the increasing militancies of factory workers, the government's inability to resist movements toward complete autonomy on the part of the Finns and the Ukrainians, the continuing radicalization of soldiers at the front and rear, catastrophic breakdowns in the production and distribution of essential supplies, skyrocketing prices, and the resurgence and expanding influence of the Bolsheviks, who alone among the major political groups appeared to profit from these difficulties, and who after the sixth Congress appeared to be waiting impatiently for an early opportunity to organize an armed insurrection. In mid-August, a series of explosions and fires of unknown origin ripped through a number of factories engaged in war work. The food situation in Petrograd, already alarming, suddenly became desperate, primarily because of continuing chaos in domestic railway and water transport systems. On August 21st, there came perhaps the blackest news of all. The Germans had occupied the city of Riga, a vital seaport on the Baltic. Now hordes of anxious citizens, at least those who were financially able to do so, made hurried preparations to abandon Petrograd in expectation of further civil disorders and an early enemy assault on the capital. A sudden dramatic rise in the number of houses and apartments advertised for rent bore eloquent testimony to the prevailing panic. No one was more troubled by these ominous signs of continuing political, social, and economic disintegration than Kerensky, yet fearful that naked repression untempered by reform would arouse the Soviet and bring the Petrograd masses into the streets once again, and unable to unite his cabinet behind a reform program of any kind, he was incapable of significantly influencing the course of events. In view of the resulting paralysis of national leadership, um, of national leadership, increasing numbers of industrial and business figures, representatives of gentry, gentry interests, military officers, in short, a broad spectrum of liberal, not to speak of conservative opinion, and even allied representatives in Russia concluded that the second coalition government was no more viable than the first. For these groups, the lone remaining hope of restoring order at the front and arresting chaos in the rear seemed to be an alliance of anti-socialist, liberal, and conservative forces, and the establishment of a strong dictatorship dedicated to the task of eliminating, conf uh, of eliminating conflicting sources of political authority, most importantly the Soviet, bridling the revolution and marshalling the Russian population in defense of the motherland. By August 1917, this orientation was shared by most cadets, and by such important centrist political pressure groups as the All-Russian Union of Moscow. It has recently been shown that while a minority of cadet leaders responded to the events of late July and August by calling for continued support of coalition government and close cooperation with moderate socialists in the satisfaction of mass demands for reform, the main body of the party, headed by Milyakov, shifted decisively rightward. At the same time, cadets of this persuasion tended, by and large, to shy away from direct participation in preparations for a coup d'etat. This appears to have been the position of the All-Russian Union of Trade and Industry and the Union of Landowners as well. Believing that any effort to establish a dictatorship not endorsed by both the cabinet and the Soviet would most likely fail, for the time being they sought simply to exert pressure both within and outside the government.
for the most forceful measures possible to restore law and order and the fighting capacity of the armed forces. Other sizable center and rightist political groups impatient with Kerensky at this time had no such reservations about how a, dictator a dictatorship should be established. Predictably, among the most prominent of these more militant groups were various organizations representing military officers. Embittered elements of the officer corps had first begun to consider possibilities for a military dictatorship as early as April 1917. Subsequently, their number grew rapidly and representatives of a host of military organizations began swarming around army headquarters in Moglev, like bees in a hive, concocting elaborate schemes to halt and reverse the changes wrought by the February Revolution. In July and August, the most important of these militant pressure groups representing officers were the Union of Officers of the Army and Navy, whose central or main committee was permanently headquartered in Moglev, and the Military League and the Union of St. George Cavaliers, both based in Petrograd. Among civilian organizations of similar orientation functioning during the summer of 1917, the Society for the Economic Rehabilitation of Russia and the Republican Center were probably the most prominent. The Society for the Economic Rehabilitation of Russia first formed in April 1917 and headed by Alexander Guchkov and Alexei Putilov, initially united influential figures in the fields of business, industry, and insurance to finance the preparation and dissemination of anti-Bolshevik propaganda and to support candidates for election to the Constituent Assembly. But as the political crisis in Russia deepened, the society began to work closely with top military personnel and to devote increasing attention to the support of preparations for the establishment of a military dictatorship. The evolution of the Republican Center was similar. Founded in May under the auspices of the powerful Siberian Bank by conservative business and military leaders to support a propaganda campaign aimed at breaking the spontaneous revolutionary movement, the Republican Center soon acquired an active military section. Headed by Colonel L.P. Decemeter, and including representatives of all of the more important military officer groups operating at the time, this organ concerned itself almost exclusively with technical preparations for the seizure of power. It remains to be recorded that during the spring and summer of 1917, these military and civilian rightist organizations considered several prominent military figures for the post of dictator. Among them, Generals Alexeev and Bruslov and Admiral Kolchak. By late July, however, the obvious favorite had become General Lavr Kornilov, the newly appointed commander-in-chief of the Russian army. Short, lean, noticeably bandy-legged in stature, straightforward and tough in manner, Kornilov was distinguished by his narrow beard, his thick, graceful mustache, and the slanted eyes and high cheekbones of his Mongolian forebears. Born into the family of a Cossack officer in 1870 and raised in a remote corner of Siberia, Kornilov received a narrowly military education and began his professional career as an explorer of, the Chi of Chinese Turkestan and the eastern provinces of Persia. He saw action in Manchuria in the Russo-Japanese War and served from 1907 to 1911 as military attaché in the Russian leg legation in Peking. During the first months of World War I, he advanced rapidly in rank, and early in 1914, he received command of an infantry division. Shortly thereafter, in the spring of 1915, the bulk of his division was annihilated by Austrian forces. Kornilov himself was captured while wandering in the woods and subsequently spent close to a year in Hungarian prison camp. An impression of Kornilov's state of mind during his confinement was recorded by General E.I. Martinov, who shared quarters with the general in captivity and under whom Kornilov had served in Manchuria. According to Martinov, during those months of rising popular indignation against the Tsarist regime in Russia, Kornilov gnawed by thwarted ambition 
passed the hours of enforced leisure engrossed in books about Napoleon, a pastime which only caused him further frustration. Martinov maintained that at that time Kornilov was, a sim was sympathetic to the Black Hundreds. Reading in the Austrian press of the struggle between progressive Duma leaders and the Russian government, Kornilov talked incessantly of the pleasure he would derive from hanging all those Guchkovs and Mulyakovs. In July 1916, Kornilov, disguised as an Austrian soldier, managed to escape and return to Russia. Largely because of, pu of publicity in the Russian press thirsting for triumphs, however small, during this militarily bleak period, Kornilov became a national hero overnight. Kornilov's escape, more than anything else, fostered the aura of courage and bravery which surrounded him by the time of the February Revolution. Apart from this, his military record was undistinguished, a fact that once prompted General Brusilov to comment brusquely. He was the commander of a mounted partisan detachment and nothing more. After the February events, Kornilov made a rapid, if superficial, adjustment to the changed political atmosphere. Appointed commander of the Petrograd Military District at the urging of Duma leaders in search of a well-known and authoritative figure to help restore order and calm, Kornilov commented to reporters upon his arrival in the capital on March 5th that the revolution ensures victory over the enemy. Shortly afterward, having paid a dutiful call on the executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet, Kornilov set off for Tsartsko Selo to arrest the Empress Alexandra. Yet for all this outward display of revolutionary zeal, Kornilov remained very much an officer of the old school. National political issues interested him only insofar as they affected the primary task of restoring the army. He was described by Martinov as an absolute ignoramus in the realm of politics, and by General Alexeyev, who also knew him well, as a man with a lion's heart and the brains of a sheep. Kornilov understood very little about the conflicting concerns of the various political groups and classes within Russian society. He drew little distinction, for example, between the moderate socialist leadership of the Petrograd Soviet, which, while working for a negotiated compromised compromise peace, nonetheless steadfastly supported the Russian defense effort in the Bolsheviks. Um, who condemned the war and the defense effort all, altogether. After all, was not the Soviet responsible for initiating the breakdown of traditional military discipline in the armed forces and for all those meddlesome committees and political commissars? During the height of the April protests, Kornilov, his patience exhausted, had called out his artillery with the, with the intent of using it against demonstrating workers and soldiers. But this order was immediately countermanded by the Petrograd Soviet, in response, Kornilov abruptly resigned his command and departed for the southwestern front, bristling with antagonism toward the Soviet, and hostility and bitterness toward the provisional government for what he considered its spinelessness in dealing with Russia's internal enemies. From this moment, Kornilov was understandably suspect in Soviet circles, while among workers and soldiers in Petrograd his name was fast becoming synonymous with repression and counter-revolution. At the same time, Kornilov's tough approach to the problem of controlling civil disorder attracted the attention of conservatives, who began to look upon him as the potential strongman to head a more authoritarian government. Indeed, members of an embryonic Petrograd rightist organization formed in mid-March by Vasily Zavoyko and E.P. Semenov began, began to focus on Kornilov as a potential dictator in April. At the time, a member of the Zavoyko Semenov circle initiated discussions with Kornilov, who expressed his willingness to work with the group. In order to maintain a, li a liaison after the general's unexpected departure for the front, Zavoyko himself enlisted in the army and became Kornilov's orderly. Zavoyko, a shady character later universally condemned as a political intriguer of the worst sort, quickly acquired enormous influence over Kornilov. The general subsequently testified that Zavoyko's services to him were mainly literary. Since Zavoyko wielded a skillful pen, he affirmed,
I had him draw up orders and papers requiring a particularly strong artistic style. It is obvious, however, that the functions performed by Zavoiko went significantly beyond those of a literary nature. The relationship was defined more accurately by Martinov. With such a flimsy store of knowledge, Kornilov was in need of guidance, and Zavoiko became his personal guide, one would say mentor, on all state matters. From the moment of his appointment to Kornilov's staff, Zavoiko fed Kornilov's anxieties about the government in Petrograd, nurtured his superior's personal ambitions, worked unceasingly to further Kornilov's popularity as a potential national leader, and, as time went on, stood at the centre of all the political intrigues constantly swirling around the general. The beginning of the, beginning of the June offensive found Kornilov in command of the 8th Army on the southwestern front, when the Germans reinforced Austrian troops there and launched a powerful counterattack, the 8th Army was soundly battered. But for a short time between June 23rd and 29th, 8th Army forces made some gains, taking the ancient Galician town of Halitz, moving on towards Kalitz, and in the process capturing some 12,000 enemy soldiers and 200 artillery pieces. Kornilov's trophies, they were proudly dubbed by the press. This occurred at a time when the Russian advance in, in other areas had been reversed, and jingoistic papers in Petrograd reacted jubilantly. More than any other officer, Kornilov received personal credit for Russia's short-lived military successes, subsequently in no small part because of Zavoyko's talents as a publicity agent. Kornilov attracted wide notice for his willingness to trade space for lives, and even more for his insistence that spontaneously retreating soldiers be fired upon as a means of restoring discipline. At the same time, the Russian commander-in-chief, General Brusilov, and of course the Bolsheviks were made to bear the onus for Russia's defeats. All this publicity increased Kornilov's popularity with the right it also brought the general's qualities to the attention of Maximilian F Filonenko, a right SR and government commissar with the 8th Army, and Boris Savinkov, commissar for the Southwestern Front and ultimately a figure of no small historical importance. Savinkov was a revolutionary extremist who turned rabid chauvinist under the impact of the Great War. Political conspirator par excellence, Sevenkov had been one of the most flamboyant and notorious figures in the famous terrorist SR battle organization between 1903 and 1905. He had, in fact, taken a prominent part in the sensational killings of numerous Tsarist officials, among them Nicholas II's hated Minister of the Interior, Vyacheslav Plev, and the Grand Duke Sergei. After 1905, Savinkov spent much of his time abroad where he busied himself writing a number of popular novels once uncharitably described by Wojtynski as a mixture of pulp magazine technique with revolutionary yarns and a cheap imitation of Dostoevsky's generously spiced with eroticism imported from France. At the outbreak of World War I, Savinkov enlisted in the French army, and in April 1917, he returned to Russia and placed himself at the disposal of the provisional government. In the early summer, Savinkov, who was close to Kerensky, then Minister of War, was appointed government representative on the Southwestern Front. As a front commissar, Savinkov had witnessed firsthand the virtual disintegration of Russian combat units. On July 9th, in great anguish, he had apprised Kerensky by telegraph of the horrors then unfolding. In his approach to the problem of the army, Savinkov naturally differed from those who repudiated in toto the changes in the armed forces wrought by the revolution. Rather, he emphasized the crucial role of civil commissars in overseeing the behavior of officers and in smoothing relations between them and the mass of radicalized soldiers. With somewhat less vigor, he defended the he defended the role of democratic com committees, albeit with strictly limited and well-defined competence. Nonetheless, Savinkov was also a strong advocate of severe measures to restore order at home and on the front, 
an outlook which Phil Filinenko shared. There's some evidence that in late July, Savinkov had sent out Milyukov about the possibility of establishing a military dictatorship. At the same time, both he and Phil Filinenko began to look to Kornilov for leadership in halting the flood of desertions from the front and for help in pressuring Kerensky to acquiesce in the creation of an authoritarian regime. One of Kerensky's first actions upon becoming Prime Minister on July 8th, instigated quite likely by Savinkov and Filinenko, was the appointment of Kornilov as commander of the Southwestern Front. Here, enemy pressure was greatest and the disintegration of Russian units most advanced. Kornilov wasted no time in reinforcing his reputation for iron firmness. On the day he assumed command in a telegram to Kerensky drafted by Zavoyko, Kornilov demanded the authoritarian, or the, sorry, the authorization of capital punishment for fleeing soldiers in terms so threatening that Savinkov was forced to intercede and insist the message be revised. The next day, without waiting for Kerensky's reply, Kornilov ordered his subordinate commanders to use machine guns and artillery on units falling back without orders. Oops. Kerensky did not need Kornilov's warning to appreciate the gravity of Russia's military situation and the need for drastic measures to halt the waves of Russian soldiers now rushing pell-mell from the battlefield. On July 9th, even before receipt of Kornilov's first telegram, Kerensky had issued orders to all commanders to fire on units retreating without authority. Three days later, upon Kerensky's recommendation, the provisional government officially reinstituted the use of capital punishment to maintain discipline at the front. Nonetheless, evidence of Kornilov's effort at applying pressure on the government was leaked to the press, quite likely by the resourceful Zavoyko. Accounts in nationalist papers in Petrograd conveyed the impression that Kornilov was pushing the government to authorize stern measures to restore discipline in the army. This was true. While Kerensky was acting reluctantly in response to this pressure, this was not the case at all. As a result, in rightist circles, Kornilov's stock soared while the governments took a corresponding plunge. Among the masses, meanwhile, Kornilov's image as perhaps the foremost symbol of counter-revolution was significantly reinforced. On July 16th, Kerensky, accompanied by Foreign Minister Tereshenko and by Savinkov and Filinenko, met at General Staff Headquarters in Stavka or, sorry, Stavka, in Muglev, with the Russian military high command. This emergency council was organized at Kerensky's behest to evaluate jointly the military situation on all fronts in the wake of the enemy's successful counter-offensive and to consider ways of halting the disintegration of the army. Because of the particularly unstable situation on the southwestern front, Kornilov had been directed to remain at his post and telegraph a report to the conference. But most of the other top Russian generals were present, among them the commander-in-chief, General Brusilov, General Denikin, Western Front commander, General Klumbovsky from the Northern Front, and Generals Rusky and Alexiev, both temporarily unassigned. Not unexpectedly, these officers vented their bitterness at the changes that the revolution had brought to the army. One after the other, they blasted the Soviet and the provisional government in general, as well as Kerensky personally, for having directly facilitated the army's ruin. At the core of the general's complaints were incompetent commissars and constantly proliferating power-seeking committees, which they felt had subverted the authority of officers and continually interfered with military operations. As one of the front commanders declared, there cannot be dual authority in the army. The army must have one head and one authority. General Brusilov articulated the seminal importance the, general, the generals obviously attached to the army's restoration. <clears throat> There's only one reason for all the difficulties that the provisional government has experienced in Petrograd <coughs> and for all the disasters within Russia, namely the absence of an army. Implicit in the general's comments was their conviction that the government government's permissiveness was primarily to blame for the army's troubles 
and concomitantly that the imposition of strict discipline in the ranks, <coughs> along with appropriate legal and administrative sanctions, would alone restore the fighting capacity of the army. The generals made it clear that if Kerensky were unwilling to act decisively in this regard without further delay, they would be compelled to take matters into their own hands. The longest, most impassioned speech was delivered by General Denikin, a dashing, young, much-decorated hero of the early war years, who followed his indictment of Kerensky and post-revolutionary conditions in the army with a series of blunt demands for immediate implementation by the government, which subsequently received strong support from most of his colleagues. Denikin insisted on complete freedom of action for the generals in all military matters. He called for the immediate abolition of commissars and democratic committees. The revocation of the Declaration of Soldiers' Rights, the restoration in full of the traditional authority of officers, the reintroduction of capital punishment and the use of special military courts to reimpose discipline among units in the rear, and the total prohibition of political activity in the army. In sum, not only a return to the old order among troops and battle zones, but the extension of repressive measures to military forces everywhere in Russia. Beyond this, Denikin demanded the formation of special punitive units for use by commanders to impose their authority by force when necessary. One of the participants in the July 16th Council at Stavka recorded that Kerensky listened to Denikin's indictment in stunned silence, hunched over a table, his head buried in his arms, and that Tereshenko was moved to tears by the oppressive report. If one may say so, Denikin was the hero of the occasion. General, uh, General Alexeev later recorded appreciatively in his diary. Compared with Denikin's bombast, Karnilov's report to the council was relatively mild, no doubt partly because Zavoyko was away at the time, and Savinkov and Filonenko had had some influence in its preparation. That Kornilov was basically in sympathy with Denikin is, a, is attested to by a telegram that Kornilov dispatched to him immediately upon receiving the text of Denikin's speech. I would sign such a report with both hands, is what he said. Kornilov's telegraphed report while affirming the need for the traditional prestige and disciplinary authority of officers to be restored for strict curbs on political activity in the armed forces and for the extension of capital punishment and special courts to the rear, at the same time implied that commanders were, some, were to some degree responsible for breakdowns in order and discipline. Indeed, Kornilov called for a purge of the officer corps. In contrast to the other generals' blanket condemnation of commissars and committees, Kornilov's report was silent on the problem of civil interference in military matters. Beyond this, Kornilov actually proposed expanding the role of commissars, an unmistakable mark of Sevenkov's influence. Finally, while insisting on the necessity of defining precisely and limiting narrowly the Democratic Committee's sphere of competence, Kornilov, unlike his fellow commanders, did not call for their immediate elimination. In the course of the train trip back to Petrograd after the July 16th Council at Stavka, Kerensky, coaxed by Savinkov and Filonenko, apparently made up his mind to remove Bruslov and promote Kornilov to the post of commander-in-chief. Two days later, these changes were announced. At the same time, Kerensky named General Vladimir Cheremisov to replace Kornilov as commander of the Southwestern Front. Savinkov was to recall much later that he and Filonenko had urged Bruslov's removal because of his inability to cope with crisis in the army, and had pushed Kornilov as his replacement because of the firmness and coolness under pressure exhibited by the latter during his tenure, one week, a Southwestern Front commander. This may well be true. At the time, Savinkov and Filonenko were preoccupied with finding a leader who would apply force decisively and unflinchingly against recalcitrant troops. It is harder to understand why, in view of his own personal political ambitions, Kerensky has accepted the recommendation. At precisely this time, the new prime minister was engaged in a desperate effort to defend himself against attacks from both the extreme left and right 
and to piece together a second centrist liberal socialist coalition. His prospects for success in this venture were as yet uncertain. By now, Kornilov, by virtue of his growing popularity among liberals and conservatives, had become a powerful political figure and a natural rival to Kerensky. Kerensky subsequently claimed that his elevation of Kornilov was dictated by the latter's merits as a commander in the field and by his enlightened position on reform in the army, particularly his view of the future role of political commissars and democratic committees. Yet this explanation does not ring true. Kornilov's achievements on the battlefield were undistinguished, and the July 16th telegram notwithstanding, his predilection for the application of massive military force to curb disorder at home and at the front was a matter of record. It was probably Kornilov's reputation for severity and toughness, rather than his alleged readiness to accommodate revolutionary change, that now made him attractive to Kerensky. What the army needed, Kerensky appears to have concluded, was a strong personality at its head. On this, he was basically in agreement with Sevenkov and Filonenko. To the new prime minister, anxiously working to consolidate his political position, the selection of Kornilov had the added advantage of being extremely popular with disgruntled liberals and conservatives and with the non-socialist press in Petrograd. It is also well to keep in mind that Kerensky's options in the matter of a new commander were quite limited. That the ineffective Brusilov had to go was by now universally acknowledged. Yet judging by the proceedings of the council at Stavka, most senior Russian commanders were at least as reactionary and personally antagonistic to Kerensky as Kornilov. Kerensky might have considered two relatively junior officers who were not invited to Stavka on July 16th. Kornilov's replacement as commander of the 8th Army, General Cheremisov, and the commander of the Moscow Military District, General Verkovsky. However, precisely because they rejected the idea that repressive measures alone could restore discipline in the army, and because they were willing to work with committees and commissars and to purge the officer corps of ultra-reactionaries, Chermasov and Verkovsky were, were suspect among many of the elements whose support Kerensky sought to win. As to the danger of independent political action by Kornilov Savinkov, who now stepped up to the post of Deputy Minister of War, and Filonenko, who was simultaneously named Commissar at Stev, at Stev headquarters, doubtless expected that since they had been able to moderate Kornilov's behavior in the past, it would be possible to continue to do so. Very likely they transmitted this assurance to Kerensky. It immediately, it immediately became apparent to Kerensky that controlling Kornilov, surrounded in Moglev by right extremists, would not be easy. The day after his appointment, July 19th, in a bluntly worded telegram drafted by Zavoyko and leaked at once to the press, Kornilov made his assumption of command of the army contingent upon Kerensky's acceptance of a series of demands altogether as ominous as those voiced by Denikin at the Stavka Council. Kornilov insisted that, as commander-in-chief, he would not be subject to regulation of any kind and that he would be responsible only to his conscience and to the people as a whole. He demanded total independence in regard to operational directives and appointments of commanders. Special courts and the application of capital punishment to enforce discipline were to apply to soldiers in the rear, as well as those at the front. Kornilov further demanded government acceptance of all the other recommendations he had made to the Stavka Council. Additionally, on July 20th, the new commander-in-chief wired Kerensky, insisting that the appointment of Cherimasov as commander of the Southwestern Front be rescinded. There is evidence that after receiving these telegrams, Kerensky began to have second thoughts about the appointment of Kornilov as supreme commander and seriously considered dropping the idea. Yet he was now in an extremely awkward position. Kornilov's appointment had been made public, and, thanks to Zavoyko, the general's conditions were also widely known. The cadets, all other liberal and conservative groups, and the non-socialist press had already formed in solid ranks behind Kornilov. Their attitude was expressed by Novo Vremia on July 20th. 
It was difficult, in fact, probably impossible to find a more suitable general and supreme commander in these days of mortal danger being experienced by Russia. The provisional government was forced to choose between meetings at the front, the disintegration of the army, the destruction of southern Russia, and the saving of the state, and it found in itself the courage and decisiveness, decisiveness to make the choice. Oh, that's the end of that quotation. A break with Kornilov at this point probably would have put an end to the de delicate negotiations that then underway to form a new coalition government with the cadets, and so a compromise of sorts was hastily arranged be between Kornilov and Kerensky. Kornilov, for his part, pledged responsibility to the government and dropped his insistence on the immediate implementation of his other conditions. The government, in turn, committed itself to giving the demands of the general a sympathetic hearing and to acting on them with all deliberate speed. Kerensky also agreed to find another post for Cheremisov, although this concession was of no apparent import at the time. Kerensky was ultimately to pay very dearly, dearly for it. General Kornilov subsequently made two trips from Moglev to Petrograd in an effort to persuade the cabinet to implement his recommendations. The first visit took place on August 3rd. On this occasion, Kornilov brought along a formal proposal, another example of Zavoyko's writing talent, embodying most of the demands for the repression of troops at the front and rear and for the restoration of officers' authority that had been made by Denikin and Kornilov at the Stavka Council, as well as the conditions pressed by Kornilov on July 19th. Although Kornilov no longer insisted on unlimited authority for himself in the August 3rd proposal, he now reversed his earlier standing, or his earlier stand regarding the future role of commissars, calling for strict limitation rather than expansion of their authority. He also envisioned a narrower, more tightly controlled role for democratic committees than he had suggested in his memo of July 16th. Still, as Kerensky later acknowledged, he, Savinkov, and Filonenko were ready, in principle, to support all these measures. They found Kornilov's formal proposal so crude in style and potentially inflammatory in language, however, that all three agreed the document could not be submitted even to a closed session of the cabinet. Filonenko was therefore assigned to rework the proposal in more diplomatic terms for presentation to the government by Kornilov on August 10th. While given an audience by the cabinet before leaving the capital on August 3rd, Kornilov did not mention his recommendations for reform, restricting his comments to general observations on prevailing conditions in the army. When the Petrograd press got wind of the contents of Kornilov's proposal, the news set off a fierce and prolonged public controversy between the center and right, staunchly supportive of Kornilov and his program, and the moderate and extreme left united once again in opposition particularly particularly to the extension of capital punishment to the rear and the curbing of democratic committees. In an antagonistic front page editorial on August 4th, Rabakaya Gazeta, I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, for example, lashed out at the cadets and indirectly at Kornilov for advocating a return to the ways of the old regime, complaining that it was precisely this traditional severe discipline that it made the old army a reliable instrument of the autocracy. Cadets, the editorial demanded, tell us directly which people do you have in mind as military dictators? Whom are you preparing for the part of Napoleon? Among rank and file workers, soldiers and sailors, the alarm over Kornilov's program rekindled the still smoldering protest against the restoration of capital punishment at the front. Thus, on August 7th, it will be recalled the worker section of the Petrograd Soviet adopted a strongly worded resolution demanding that capital punishment be rescinded. At about this time, it appeared that General Cheremisov in Petrograd for reassignment was in close touch with moderate socialist leaders. Izvestia, on August 4th, carried accounts of the press conferences held the previous day by General Kornilov following his meeting with the cabinet and by General Cheremisov. In response to reporters' questions, Kornilov had once again emphasized the importance of immediate authorization by the government of broader repressive measures and deprecated the future role of democratic committees.
In contrast, the burden of Cheremisov's comments was that repressive measures alone, not even mass executions, could restore discipline, that it would be impossible to do so as long as the soldiers did not understand and accept the necessity, obligation, and duty of carrying on the war. In the task of raising the consciousness of the troops, Chermasov attached great importance to joint efforts by officers and democratic committees. Izvestia pointedly contrasted the two statements. Today we bring you accounts of two conferences, with General Kornilov and, and with General Chermasov, on the same subject, but just take note of how they differ. At the same time that the first stubbornly insists on all-out repressive measures, and completely disregards the importance of army organizations. The second puts the center of gravity in the struggle with disintegration in the army on the joint work of the officer staff with organizations of soldiers. The, symp the sympathy of the democracy is not on the side of Kornilov. By the second week in August, rumors not without some foundation were circulating in the capital that Kerensky had suggested to those around him that Kornilov would not work in the post of commander in chief and that Chermasov might be a suitable replacement. When word of Kerensky's wavered, wavering sorry, reached Moglev, Kornilov, and his entourage were naturally alarmed. The campaign of liberal and conservative groups on Kornilov's behalf was intensified. Non-socialist papers featured daily pledges of support for Kornilov from organizations such as the Union of Officers, the Union of Cossack Troops, and the Union of St. George Cavaliers. Between August 8th and 10th, Moscow was the scene of a widely publicized conference of public figures, attended by several hundred specially invited leaders of business, industry, agriculture, the professions, the army, and liberal and conservative political groups. The primary purpose of the conference was the adoption of mutually acceptable positions on major issues for presentation to the broader Moscow State Conference, Due to, op due to open on August 12th. Among the delegates were the wealthy industrialists, Ryabushinsky, Tretyakov, Konovalov, and Vishnogradsky, a large group of cadets led by Milyukov and a host of top military leaders, including generals Alexiev, Brusilov, Kaladin, and Yudinich. On August 9th, these dignitaries interrupted their consideration of broad political issues to adopt a pledge of, co of confidence in Kornilov. This declaration, dispatched to Kornilov and widely circulated the same day, affirmed that all attacks on Kornilov's authority in the army and in Russia were treachery, and that all thinking Russia looked to Kornilov with hope and faith. May God help you, the resolution concluded, in your great task of reconstructing a powerful army and saving Russia. While the public fur over Kornilov raged on, Fulanenko busied himself with the revision of Kornilov's August 3rd proposal for consideration by the cabinet on August 10th. Not content merely to recast the document in more moderate language, he introduced some sweeping recommendations for drastic controls over rail lines and factories. Thus, he added a provision that all railroads be placed under martial law Failure on the part of rail workers to fulfill directives was to carry the same penalty as a soldier's refusal to obey orders at the front, that is, summary execution. To implement these measures, he recommended that military revolutionary courts be set up at major railway depots. A further provision added by Filinenko called for the country's coal mines and all factories engaged in defense work. Practically speaking, this could be interpreted to include almost all factories to be placed under military control. In these enterprises, strikes, lockouts, political meetings, and in fact, assemblies of any kind were to be, pro were to be prohibited for the duration. Employees would be assigned minimum mandatory work quotas. Workers not meeting their quotas would be dismissed summ summarily and dispatched to the front. These measures injected Filinenko at the end of the revised draft must be adopted and put into practice immediately with iron decisiveness and consistency. Savinkov fully, sim Savinkov, fully sympathetic to Filinenko's recommendations, pleaded with Kerensky to support them within the cabinet, and even resigned when the Prime Minister demurred. <laughs> 
Kerensky initially initially rejected Sevenkov's resignation, later accepted it, and ultimately, partly because of pressure from Kornilov, prevailed upon Sevenkov to return to his post. Kerensky himself has acknowledged that to halt the slide of industry and transport into absolute chaos, he would gladly have taken the lead in implementing the steps envisioned by Filonenko. Within liberal and conservative circles, of course, and even among members of the cabinet, the need for such extreme measures had already been widely discussed. In view of the storm from the left that Kornilov's more limited August 3rd program had provoked, however, Kerensky was understandably apprehensive about the probable impact of Filonenko's amendments on the leadership of the Soviet, not to mention the workers and soldiers. His conclusion seems to have been that much that such measures would have brought a decisive rupture with the Soviet, a bloody confrontation of uncertain outcome with the Bolshevik-led masses, and at the very best, the establishment of an authoritarian government, completely at the mercy of the military. Unlike large numbers of former moderates, Kerensky paused for the moment on the brink of such a drastic course. Kornilov, warned by members of his entourage and Maglev of plots being hatched against him in Petrograd, tried to beg off coming to the capital on August 10th. This was completely agreeable to Kerensky, who, although quite willing to use Kornilov to carry out repression at the front, was understandably nervous about the general's popularity with the right and his potential influence on national politics. Savinkov and Filonenko, to the contrary, were determined to employ pressure from Kornilov to force Kerensky's acceptance of the revised Kornilov program. They therefore persuaded the commander-in-chief not to cancel his trip. Kornilov remained wary, however, taking with him to Petrograd a bodyguard of Turkmen soldiers, alarmed with machine or sorry, armed with machine guns. Shortly after Kornilov's train left Moglev for the capital, a telegram from Kerensky reached Stavka, informing the commander in chief that the government had not called him, did not insist on his coming, and in view of the strategic situation, could not take responsibility for his departure from the front. Arriving in Petrograd, Kornilov was met at the, fr at the train by Filonenko and Savinkov, who brought with them the revised report. Giving the document his hasty approval, the general set off at once for the Winter Palace. Petrograd newspapers the following day carried detailed accounts of his colorful motor car m sorry, motorcade. Strict military security was observed along the route. Kornilov's car, moving slowly through the streets, was guarded by grim-faced, scarlet-robed Turkomen soldiers jogging alongside, their curved swords dangling unsheathed from their belts. It was preceded and followed by open-top automobiles filled with more Turkmen's armed with machine guns. When the procession neared the Winter Palace, Kerensky, at an upper-story window, watched in amazement and disbelief as the Turkomans jumped from the cars and dashed to the entrance. And placing a machine gun in the main vestibule, they took up positions beside it, prepared if the need arose to rescue their commander by force. Such was the extraordinary prelude to a short, predictably icy encounter between Kerensky and Kornilov, which served only to exacerbate their differences and complicate their relations. At the outset, Kornilov formally presented his revised and expanded program, with which Kerensky, as we know, was already familiar. The Prime Minister's response was reportedly non-committal, although he may have conveyed the impression that the recommendations were acceptable in principle, which was actually the case. Kornilov, who had risked the trip to Petrograd and the conviction that the situation brooked no further delay, was ill-disposed to let the matter drop. He demanded that the cabinet meet that evening to discuss his proposals. Kerensky declined to call a full cabinet meeting, arranging instead an informal session to which he invited only his two closest supporters in the cabinet, Nekrasov and Tereshenko. Excluded were four cadet ministers who were geared for a decisive struggle on behalf of Kornilov's program and seven moderate socialist ministers who were certain to be unalterably opposed.
The upshot of this gathering on the evening of August 10th was that while Kerensky, Tereshenko, and Nekrasov registered their willingness to support before the full cabinet Kornilov's recommendations relating to the restoration of the army. In substance, the recommendations Kornilov first brought to Petrograd on August 3rd, they firmly insisted on laying aside the new provisions dealing with controls over railways and factories added by Filonenko. One can well imagine Kornilov's frustration as he left Petrograd for Moglev late on the night of August 10th. His encounters with the Prime Minister on August 3rd and 10th had strengthened his disdain for Kerensky personally. Worse an, instant, worse, an incident which had occurred during his meeting with the cabinet on August 3rd aroused Kornilov's fears that politics in Petrograd had generated to such a point or had degenerated to such a point that German agents had direct pipelines into the highest level of government. While Kornilov was delivering his report on the state of the army, Krensky had quietly cautioned him against being too precise about actual conditions. After the meeting, Savinkov explained to the general that while there was no evidence that any ministers were leaking information directly to the enemy, some cabinet members were in close touch with members of the all-Russian executive committees, among whom were persons suspected of having German ties. Kornilov must have been genuinely appalled by this incident, which no doubt strengthened his misgivings about Kerensky's government. But above all, his two unsuccessful attempts to get his emergency proposals before the cabinet confirmed his suspicions, initially awakened during his tenure as commander of the Petrograd military district, and constantly fed by the rightist elements surrounding him at Stavka. And the provisional government was too weak and divided to act decisively, and that independent military intervention might well be called for if the authoritarian regime necessary to take the country in hand was ever to be established. On August 6th, three days after his first visit to the capital, Kornilov initiated a request that the Petrograd military district, heretofore under the control of the Ministry of War, be placed under his direct command. Justified by the likelihood that the Petrograd area would soon be in the zone of military operations, this change, if accepted, would greatly strengthen Kornilov's hand in a military clash with the government or the left. At the same time, Kornilov ordered substantial troop dispositions obviously aimed at their possible use in Petrograd. To the delight of the right extremists who had long since been preparing for a coup, such preparations were intensified after Kornilov's second visit to Petrograd. <clears throat> in a conversation with his chief of staff, General Lukomsky, on August 11th, Kornilov explained that these actions were necessary because Bolshevik <clears throat> because a Bolshevik rising was to be expected, and it was high time to hang the German agents and spies headed by Lenin, and to disperse the Soviet of workers and soldiers in such a way that it would not reassemble anywhere. Commenting to Lukomsky on his appointment of the ultra-conservative General Krimov as commander of the troops being concentrated around Petrograd, Kornilov expressed pleasure that Krimov would not hesitate, if necessary, to hang the entire Soviet membership. Of course, all this does not necessarily mean that Kornilov was now irrevocably committed to direct military action against the government. In view of the unpopularity of the steps envisioned in Kornilov's program among the Petrograd masses and their likely response to its implementation, the troop dispositions made by Kornilov during the first half of August were advisable whether the army ultimately acted alone or in cooperation with Kerensky. It appears that Kornilov, unlike many of his supporters, still had held out some hope that the government would take stock of its situation and submit to his authority peacefully. Lukomsky recalls that Kornilov commented to him on August 11th that he was not planning to move against the government, that he hoped it would be possible to reach agreement with it. Nonetheless, it also appears clear that Kornilov was now prepared to act independently should this prove necessary. <clears throat>